Good morning, everyone. It's so good to share this Nailsy Baptist Church service with you this morning. I hope you'll find something to help you worship God and to bring you closer to him. I pray that his Holy Spirit would be a presence you can feel wherever you are this morning. Our first song this morning is Christ the Lord is Risen Today. And I suppose technically we should change the words to Christ the Lord was risen last week. This is no longer Easter Sunday. But it is true that he is still risen today. He is still living. He has still saved us from sin and death. And every Sunday we celebrate the fact that on that first Easter Sunday, Jesus Christ the Lord rose from the dead to set us free from sin and death, to reconcile us with our Father God. So let's celebrate together with the hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Two, three, four. Oh, 
Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. I praise you, Jesus, that you have washed my sin away. You have beaten death for me. You have rescued me. You have reconciled me. I am forgiven. I am free. I am able to meet my Father God face to face because of all that you did for me that first Easter Sunday. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days, we will sing your praise, O Lord. O Lord, our God. Amen. Amen. Hello everyone, it's Pete here. I'm just here to give you another quick plug for the Life Explored course, which is starting very soon. It's starting on the 22nd of April, so that is just under two weeks from now. If you have friends or family who you think might want to explore some of the questions of life and the answers that we find in the Bible and in Jesus Christ, then come along to the Life Explored course and bring them with you. Um, if you want to book in, send an email to Anne in the office. You can have a look at life-explored-nbc.blogspot.com for more information as well. All the information is there. Um, it's going to be running via Zoom on Thursday evenings from 8 till 9. So if you've got anyone who wants to come, please invite them, bring them along. We're really looking forward to starting the course. We're really looking forward to having you there. So 22nd of April, Life Explored course. Don't forget it. Be there. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Pete. That's brilliant. And can I just uh, endorse that? It's a fantastic opportunity to just be asking questions. So come along, uh, no hard sell, uh, but come along and ask your questions and explore life together with us. Now, you won't have uh, failed to notice uh, the news reports of the, the death recently of Prince Philip, and uh, along with uh, churches uh, across the nation and indeed across the, the world, we're going to pray for our Queen and for her family right now. Let's pray. Lord God, we give thanks for the life and example of Prince Philip, for his love of our country, and for his devotion to duty. And Lord, we stand now with all who grieve the loss of loved ones. We stand now with all who struggle with the effects of death. And we pray that you are close to those who mourn as you promise to be. And that you will help all of us to live every day in service of one another and in obedience to your kingship, to your majesty. We lift our queen to you and ask, Lord, that as she leans into you, as she depends upon you, as so often she speaks of, we pray that you will comfort her and her family and that you will be to them the peace that they need at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. How are you doing? I hope your Easter holidays are going well and you've enjoyed your first week and maybe been able to meet up with some people. Now I want you this morning to imagine that you're going to have a party and the people that you're going to invite to your party are going to sit on this side of me but there are some people that you might not want to have at your party and they're going to sit on this side. So let's start off with Bob. Now Bob is kind um, and Bob will play in the playground with children that don't have anyone to play with. So let's invite someone who's kind to our party. 
and put Bob there. Next we've got Tina and um, Tina can be a little bit rough sometimes in the playground and rough when you play and she doesn't really think about other people she always just thinks about herself. Do we want her at our party? No, she's gonna go on this side. Sorry, Tina. Okay, who should we have next? Let's have Stephen. Now, Stephen is really thoughtful and will often buy you presents or make you cards or write you letters. So we're gonna have Stephen at our party. Let's give them some party hats. Here we go. Right, who is next? Oh, we've got Levi here. Now, Levi can be a little bit naughty sometimes and he sometimes steals things. Now, we don't want someone at our house at our party who steals things, so sorry, but we're not gonna invite you to our party. Now, I would choose probably to sit on this side to have a party with these nice people. But Jesus chose to have a party with people or one person in particular that no one liked. And we'll come back to that later. Now, first of all, have a look at this and have a look at these. Who would use these sorts of things in here? I wonder, and my stethoscope here, who would use this? A doctor would use these. A doctor helps people to get better when they are sick. And the man in our story today was sick and needed a doctor, but not the kind of doctor that you or I know not one to fix bones or bad coughs. <clears throat> Let's see what his problem was and what sort of a doctor he needed. So on to our story. There was once a man called Levi and he was a tax collector. He was born as one of God's people, but he ended up swapping sides and working for the enemy. He worked for the Romans. For all you Star Wars fans, he went to the dark side. The Romans made life hard for the people and the people had to pay money called tax. And the tax collectors collected the tax. But as if paying for the Romans wasn't bad enough, the tax collectors could charge whatever they liked and the people had to pay it. So if you owed two coins to the Romans for your tax, then Levi here, the tax collector, he could charge you whatever you liked. So he could charge you four coins instead. And he would give two to the Romans and keep two for himself. Levi got rich by stealing and no one could argue with him because the Romans were on his side. Levi didn't love God with all his heart. The crown there that represents God and the crown is crossed out. Levi didn't love God with all his heart and this was his problem and he needed a doctor to fix his sin problem. Sin is a problem that we all have. Not loving God with all of our hearts, just the way that he deserves. One day, Jesus went out and he saw Levi in the tax office. He said to Levi, follow me. Levi got up, he left everything and he followed Jesus. 
Now, sometimes in live wires, we play a game called What's Changed? Can you tell me what's changed here? That's right, the party hats have moved from those bears to these bears. The bears that nobody liked and that nobody wanted at their party. But Levi was so happy that he had a party for Jesus at his house. And there were lots of other tax collectors too and people that no one liked. Levi was so happy because Jesus had fixed his sin problem. So now, instead of not loving God, he loved God and he has had his sin forgiven because of Jesus. Just outside the party, there were some other people and these people were called the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees were the good people. And unlike Levi, they didn't think they had done anything wrong. Everything they did was good and they thought they had done all that they needed to do to make God happy. They said to Jesus, why are you eating with these tax collectors and sinners? And they were angry because they thought that they were good and not sinners. They didn't think that they needed Jesus. But Jesus went on to tell everybody that he was like a doctor. And he had come to invite sinners to change their hearts and their lives. It wasn't just Levi who was sick with sin, it was the Pharisees as well. They were both sick with sin. Can a doctor cure sin? No, doctors only fix bones and make our bodies better. But Jesus can fix our heart problem. And if we see that we need Jesus and we say sorry for our sin and turn around and away from our old life, like Levi did, then Jesus can mend our hearts. And we're going to sing a song in a minute called Mighty, Mighty Saviour, which says you can wash away my sin and you can change my heart within. So we can give thanks for that today. And in your Meals with Jesus book, if you're following along with that, it's the first four studies that go along with this story that have got some really fun and interesting things that you can do with your family to learn even more about this story. So have a good second week of your Easter holidays and I'll see you next Sunday. Bye. One, two, three, four.
Now we're going to hear today's reading. Luke 5, verse 27 to 32. Jesus calls Levi and eats with sinners. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Thank you very much, Rob. As you can uh, probably tell from my waistline, I love food. I love sitting at a table with friends and with family and feasting on good or even distinctly average food together. I enjoy the meal, usually, but most of all, though, I love the fellowship, that sense of gathering and camaraderie around a table. I love the companionship of tucking in together and laughing and chatting, sometimes even crying together. For me, and I reckon for most of us, uh, meals are important. They're important ways of engaging with others. They're important opportunities to enjoy priceless, memorable conversation. Think back. Think back over your life, and you will probably be able to recall some of the great times that you've had seated around a kitchen or a dining table, or maybe sitting there with a tray on your lap in front of the, the telly, having a conversation with somebody, or, or even as you open up a simple lunch box in the great outdoors. Again, an opportunity to eat together and be with each other. Some of my favourite family mealtime memories involve a barbecue on a beach, usually with a, a menacing seagull or three approaching, uh, and the enjoyment of a very simple but wholesome, sometimes a little bit sandy, meal of fish and meat and vegetables. Someone with whom we share food with is likely to be our friend, or at least on their way to becoming a friend. And the sense of hospitality and companionship uh, around a meal builds our relationship. Uh, and together we deepen knowledge of one another and even our love for one another. From a romantic candlelit meal for two as dreams flourish or, or a, a post-funeral tea when memories are shared in a high-class restaurant, in a simple kitchen, on a hillside, using a trangia. Some meals are occasions of great significance and meaning. Meals were significant to Jesus. Luke's Gospel is littered with examples of Jesus eating in a whole variety of contexts and with a great mixture of people. One commentator says that in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, he's at a meal, or he's coming away from a meal. So it's interesting that if we want to find out a little bit more about what Jesus is doing and who this Jesus is, especially if we want to understand more of his nature as the crucified and resurrected king that we were focusing on last week. Maybe, just maybe, it's appropriate that we look at the significance of meals for Jesus. We look at something of what's going on in the meals at which he was present. We mentioned one short meal briefly last week. Uh, those of you who were engaging with the service then, we remember that Jesus shared a very simple supper with those two travellers on the road to Emmaus. And over the next six weeks, as a whole church, we're going to be looking together at other meals. All through this series, though, 
I want to encourage you to imagine yourself there. Place yourself into the, the setting that is being described. Don't let's just read the text and assume it's all um, about other people from long ago and far away. Imagine yourself as one of the key characters. Breathe in the delicious odors from the kitchen. Relish the taste of the spices. Take time to listen carefully to the chatter that's going on around. And look deeply into the eyes of Jesus as you listen intently to what he's saying and what he's conveying in that conversation. How will we be nourished by these meals with Jesus? I wonder if you've ever been at a really, really good meal. But you begin to think to yourself while you're there that somehow you don't quite deserve to be there. I don't know if, if such a thing has, has ever happened to you. But imagine that somehow you and I ha have grabbed a seat at the top table. And just as we start to tuck in all this great food around, we both notice that almost everybody else around is, well, looking down their noses at us. Scruffy clothes, our grubby hands. There's lots of muttering about riffraff. But imagine, too, that somehow one man is looking at us very differently. It's Jesus. And, and his love and his welcome and his delight shines from his eyes towards us and, and that enables us to bathe in the extravagant grace that is somehow being communicated silently towards us. A couple of years ago I traveled to Iraq and there experienced true Middle Eastern hospitality. In Iraq when you visit the home of a local or as we sometimes did of a refugee who was settling there, you must expect to eat. It doesn't matter if this is the third or 15th place you've been to that morning. It doesn't matter if you're already full. Delicious snacks or a full-blown generous meal will be produced, and it is an affront to say no. Amazingly, even those who clearly can afford very little will still go to the, the most incredible lengths to produce the very best they can for you, the esteemed guest. And as they do so, well, they will delight in the privilege of being able to. Now, you may not feel deserving. I certainly never wanted to be treated as esteemed. But such is the extravagant grace that is shown by the host to every visitor. Now, in the eyes of the Pharisees and the religious leaders in the narrative from Luke 5, Levi was certainly not esteemed. He was a total outcast, absolutely not welcome in their pure company. Although Levi had been born a Jew, by taking on the job of the tax collector, he'd effectively sold himself out to the enemy of the Jewish people. He'd moved, as Claire so eloquently put it, to the dark side. But not only that, in collecting taxes to pass on to the local, local, local Roman governor, Levi was also able to add that little bit more to line his own pockets. He was a cheat as well as a traitor. So for all sorts of reasons, Levi was a, an unwelcome conspirator, a social outcast, a traitor to the nation. And even worse, as Jews who colluded with those opposing God's nation, tax collectors were deemed to be traitors to God. 
And such betrayal towards his nation and his God would have made it unthinkable that any self-respecting holy leader would join Levi at a meal table. But on this day, quite bizarrely, Jesus relishes the opportunity to join him for lunch. And then, and right there, Levi is completely changed by the extravagant grace that flows in his unworthy, unclean, rejected direction. Spare some sympathy, though, for the Pharisees as they look out at this large crowd of tax collectors and sinners, what is horrifyingly clear is that Jesus is not just being polite towards these enemies of God, but positively welcoming. Surely this makes any claims that Jesus was from God? Well, absolute nonsense. Unless, unless... God is doing something new. Something so new it just doesn't fit. Something so incredibly, amazingly new it just doesn't fit with their image and their experience and their understanding and their biblical study of who God is. Whatever they had experienced of God beforehand just didn't somehow equate with the reality of God breaking in in a wonderful new way that right now, right in front of them, they were seeing. All that the Pharisees knew of their religious rules and their interpretation of the law made clear the dangers of becoming unclean. And sharing a mealtime with those who didn't follow very strict and clear rules about food preparation and lifestyle well, that meant that even sitting with them caused one to become unclean. Their uncleanliness was transferred somehow to you, making you unwelcome among God's people. It's a bit like welcoming today a COVID carrier into your home and they remove their mask and start coughing and spluttering and breathing all over you. So is this just a case of Jesus not realizing who this man is? Does he not understand? Well, as we look at the wider context and the rest of Luke chapter 5, perhaps we can appreciate that Jesus actually understands perfectly well. Look, look back if you've got your Bible with you. Look back at verse 12 where Jesus touches, Jesus touches, a leper. He didn't, doesn't just talk to him. He doesn't just sort of shout at him over the fence. He touches a leper. This was thought to be the sure way, the absolute sure way of becoming unclean because the disease of leprosy is assumed to transfer onto other people, rendering them polluted just by touch. But here, instead of Jesus becoming unclean, the leper becomes clean. How incredible. Instead of the outcast transforming the holy man, God's grace transforms the exile. Suddenly it isn't uncleanness that is contagious, but something else appears to be highly transmissible. Look on to verse 17. Jesus not only heals a, a paralyzed man, he forgives his sin. Now, forgiveness of sins at the time was a lengthy, complicated, boring process of formal and exact temple rituals. But this mind-blowing Jesus forgives with just a word and without any reference to the temple. Jump on to verse 36. Jesus is driving his point home. Something new is happening. Before the Pharisees' very eyes, their very startled eyes, the old way of treating sin, the old ways of patching up error, the old ways of understanding purity are completely and utterly changed. 
And this is so new. This understanding is so new. It can't just be stitched into an antiquated way of understanding things. This is not simply an amendment to an old system. It's not an upgrade to the same old software. This is radical, radical transformation. This is extravagant grace. You see, the Pharisees have been mourning over the apparent absence of God at work in their midst. But in Jesus, God has stepped right among them. And and as he comes, Jesus is kind of sweeping away all the rules and regs that have caused so many to stumble and fall. And instead, he comes directly to the people who most need to experience and hear and feel and know and embrace the most glorious touch, the most incredible, extravagant grace of a loving God. This new Jesus way is gracious rather than religious. It's inclusive rather than exclusive. It's welcoming rather than condemning. This is a way that is characterized by feasting rather than fasting and rejoicing, not grumbling. This new way recognizes the need for relationship rather than rule keeping and finds hope in a meeting around a meal table. It's that engagement, it's that celebration, that grace which convinces Levi that he needs to change. It convinces Levi of his uncleanness and his need to embrace the change that only Jesus can offer any of us. Verse 31, as again Claire explained, uh, helps us to see how Jesus explains himself. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. You see, the Pharisees were expecting Jesus to behave a bit like a doctor who avoided sick people. But such an approach clearly doesn't work. Jesus, the Savior, cannot save unless he's getting down with those who need saving. Now, I suggested earlier that you try and imagine yourself as a participant in this meal. Where are you? Are you Levi or one of his sinner friends? You you feel like an outcast? You feel that you're just not good enough? You've had those disapproving looks from uh, other people. You've had the sarcastic comments. You've heard others rattling on about you being unworthy. But actually, you don't need anybody else to tell you that because you feel it. Deep down inside, you feel, well, like rubbish. Right now, right now, Jesus is showing you compassion and love. Maybe it's your very first experience of having known that, but the compassion and the love, the extravagant grace that Jesus wants to show you trumps any other comment, any other disapproving look, every other moan and groan and assessment of you than you have ever known or than you ever will know. Right now, Jesus is showing some of the most wonderful and generous grace you can imagine. At last, at last, here is someone who will gladly come in and eat with you. And rather than condemn you, he he simply wants to show you his love and invite you to respond. This Jesus invites us all to consider for ourselves who we are and how everything we do fits in with who he is is and with his new way of grace jesus loves you 
Jesus loves you. And he wants you to know that right here, right now, he loves you. And he longs to be a guest at every meal, on every day, in your home and your family. He wants to be invited in. He wants to be able to engage with, with you about how you live and how he asks us to live. So what do you need to leave behind to follow him? Do you see that in verse 28? And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. What's the baggage, what's the rubbish that we need to leave behind that enables us to follow Jesus? Or maybe you feel like a bit of a Pharisee. You've worked hard at this holiness stuff for a long time now. You'd quite like a bit of Jesus' attention to yourself. But is that because you long for him to conform to your way or because of your willingness to follow him? Dare we consider that actually we all need to change in the light of the example of Jesus? Dare we posit the thought that we can all be kinder, more grace-filled, more generous with our love giving? I wonder if you feel that you're on that side of the room. What do you need to do to help others follow Jesus? Jesus chose to spend his time with Levi, a man who nobody else would even talk to. How do we follow his lead? Who might we choose to engage with and eat with? How will we uh, enact the grace and share the love of the resurrected, life-giving Christ? Wherever you are in the room or as you quietly peer in through the window to eavesdrop, Jesus is not so bothered about your dodgy past as your future as your possible future. He longs to be real with you. He longs to be real with us into eternity. He longs for us all to come to repentance about anything which previously or presently hinders the fullness of relationship with him. So why not invite him? Why not him invite him into the most central part of family life around a meal? And maybe as lockdown rules allow, we could all look at these meals with Jesus as we go through this series around our own meal tables. The book that Claire mentioned encourages families to gather together and uh, to think about these, these stories, these narratives together. So why not sit down with others if you can? And as you eat together, read out the narrative of Levi and ask one another, what is this saying to you? What is Jesus saying to you? How will we welcome him? The, the generosity of Jesus is far more extravagant than anyone deserves or dares to expect. His deepest desire is to reach out to you and with purity and love, he, he wants to transform the inner secrets of our lives. His friendship is well worth investigating. His life is well worth exploring. Absolutely worth embracing. And certainly worth sharing. The radical transformation of the love of Jesus the Christ is for you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you don't hide behind religiosity and rubbish. 
Thank you, Lord, that you're not repelled by our sin and our error. Thank you, Lord, that you dismiss our grubby hearts and our ill-founded efforts. Thank you, Lord, that you are God. Help us to know your grace, not just intellectually, not just as a, as a fact that we read about in a book. Help us to know your grace deep down in our hearts, Lord, deep down in the guts of our spirits. Will you be at work in us? Will you right now change us? Will you transform us? Will you alter us? Will you do whatever you need to do to enable us to see you, to know you, to repent before you, and to live our lives for you? Holy Spirit, please be at work in us and help us to feast with you into eternity. Amen. Thank you, Peter. I found some of that very challenging. I've been a Christian for oh, about a hundred years and uh, it's very easy to forget grace and to become focused on me and me being pure or holy or whatever you want to call it. And, and I'm challenged that perhaps many of us live in a bit of a holy huddle, that we're actually quite good at being with other people who are like us. And yet Jesus wants to extend his love and his extravagant grace to those other people that we don't necessarily feel like we're the same as. Sorry, that wasn't very good grammar. Um, grace is what God gives us. He lavishes on us because he wants to. We don't deserve it. And I don't deserve it and nobody else deserves it, and yet he gives us all his grace. And maybe we need to be more grace-filled and more accepting of those people who are not like us, those people that Jesus is calling just as he called us whenever it was, a week ago or a century ago. One of the things that Peter said, re I wrote down because it really challenged me, do I want Jesus to conform to my way or do I want to follow him? That's what his grace is about. Us mirroring his grace to the world, being like Jesus, following him. Let's sing together. <clears throat> Thank you. 
A few weeks ago, we were looking at uh, the letter of 1 Timothy, Paul writing to young Timothy. And uh, in the middle of of chapter 6, Paul writes this, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. It strikes me that whether we feel ourselves as Levi or one of the sinners or one of the Pharisees, that these words fit in well. But you, person of God, flee from all this, whatever this might be, and instead pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life which Jesus offers us and to which we were called. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.